So welcome back from your break. I hope you feel refreshed. And we're now going to pick up and continue looking at the Reformation. And you'll remember in Germany, the, the, the main person in the Reformation there was Martin Luther. And in Switzerland, we've got two key leaders, Zwingli, Ulrich Zwingli, and John Calvin. John Calvin, born 1509, died 1564. And I would say he's probably the most influential theologian of the Reformation. John Calvin is associated with his, uh, the, the theological approach, which is called Calvinism. And uh, John Calvin was born in France. He studied law and the classics. And he's got an incredibly logical, detailed thinking mind. And that, 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 that comes across in his theology and the way he he preached and the way he wrote. In Paris, while studying the Greek New Testament, he was converted in 1532. And notice how, again, Zwingli became a Christian through reading the Bible. Martin Luther became a Christian through reading the Bible. And again, what was happening was the population was starved of the Bible. They were just being told what to believe by the church, and it wasn't the true gospel. So all of a sudden, when people are able to read the Bible for themselves, it's like, wow, this is a lie. This is the good, best news ever. And so John Calvin became a Christian, 1532. He joined a, in, in Paris reading the Bible. He joined a Bible study and prayer group in Paris. And within months, he was in prison because of his Christian convictions. Uh, on his release the following year, he fled to settle as a refugee in Basel in Switzerland. Um, where age 26, uh, 26 years old in 1536, he produced the first edition of his great publication called The Institutes of the Christian Religion, a systematic explanation of reformed theology when he was 26 years old. <laughs> I mean, how many 26 year olds are writing anything, let alone a meaty systematic theology? Um, when he was trying to return to France, he took a detour because of a war that was going on that was blocking his trip to France. And he found himself by accident in Geneva. And there he stayed for the next two decades. Isn't that interesting that we make our plans? We want to go, John Calvin wanted to return to France. But then because there was a war going on, he took a detour, found himself in Geneva, which then became his home for the next two decades. Geneva became the global centre for Presbyterianism, which is a particular model of reformed churches. In Geneva, a local priest called William Farrell heard the rumour that John Calvin was in town. He went to the inn where John Calvin was staying and implored him to stay. He told him that a year ago, the city council had decided that Geneva would become Protestant, but the population was unchanged, living in pleasures and in sin. And so John Calvin, on the, on the back of the persuasion from this priest, who was a Protestant now, was agreed to stay. John Calvin was pretty strict. He would commonly pull people in the middle of his preaching, pull people to the front of the church, uh, <clears throat> and he would challenge them for their sinning that week. And he would report them to the local government for discipline. He effectively cleaned up the city. Um, when, when he clashed with some local government over the church's right to ex excommunicate members, um, he and Flavel were expelled from the city. So what happened was um, John Calvin was challenging one, someone in the church for their behaviour, but this person was a friend of the local government. And so the local government said, no, you can't put that person at your church because we like that person. And John Calvin says, no, no. The church and is not under the government. The church has got to operate under God. And so there was a clash and John Calvin and his friend Farrell were expelled from the city. Calvin spent the next three years in Strasbourg and got to know Luther and the other reformers during that period. Geneva, in the meantime, slipped back into immorality. And after three years, the government sent a delegation to, to Calvin to ask him, please, can you return? He returned to Geneva. And there he labored for the next 24 years, preaching, lecturing, and writing. And Geneva became a place where Protestants fleeing from persecution would seek refuge in Geneva. 6,000 
Protestant refugees arrived in the city of Geneva. And when it was safe eventually for them to return back home, they would go back having been impacted by the gospel and by having a clear understanding from John Calvin's teachings. And they would return with the, that theology, a clear understanding of truth, and they would go back having been discipled to then spread the Reformation back in their own countries. Calvin had been keen on education and the establishment of a Bible college in Geneva, and pastors uh, from the college went all over Europe spreading reform doctrine. doctrine. This is a, an example of Calvin's weekly schedule. This was described by a friend of his who lived in Geneva. He preached commonly every day and twice on Sunday. Every week he lectured three times in theology, every Friday at the Bible study. He never failed to visit the sick in private warning and counselling uh, people pastorally. And for the rest of the numerous matters arising from ordinary exercise of his ministry. But besides these ordinary tasks, uh, there was a great, he had a great care for believers in France, both in teaching them and exhorting them and counseling them and consoling them by letters, which uh, they were being, when they were being persecuted, John Calvin would write them letters and also interceding for them. Yet all this did not prevent him from going to work at his special study and, and composing many splendid and very useful books. So you, as you can see, he was lecturing at Bible college. He was preaching every day, twice on a Sunday. He was caring for the people in his, in his pastoring, in his, in his church. He was also carrying the heart for pastors and leaders who were now being persecuted in various places. And he was writing to them to encourage them. On top of that, he was writing theological books. Wow, what incredible output. What were his beliefs? Well, let, let's kind of dig a little bit into that. Um, Sadaletto, who was a Catholic cardinal and who was a counter-reformer, wrote to the city of Geneva, challenging Calvin's teachings. And Calvin's reply to him on the subject of justification by faith is very illuminating into understanding what Calvin believes on. And here was his reply. He says, you touch upon this subject of justification by faith, the first and keenest subject of controversy between us. Whether, where, wherever the knowledge of it is taken away, the glory of Christ is extinguished. Isn't that interesting? There's a real insight into Calvin's heart. When the knowledge of justification by faith is taken away, the glory of Christ is extinguished. What does that mean? Again, it comes back to this thing. Justification by faith is this. Jesus did a work for you. Jesus paid the price for you. It's not your own work. You didn't save yourself. Jesus saved you. It was his price, his expense. He saved you. Glory to Jesus. And when the understanding of somehow you're saved by your own good works, by your own good efforts, by your own morality. So if that somehow forms the dominant thought in your thinking, then Jesus doesn't get the glory. The glory of Christ is extinguished. John Calvin's point is this. When you're preaching the true gospel, people will be God-dependent, God-glorifying, God-centered. And that's exactly where life comes, where salvation comes. For Calvin, the fundamental error of Rome was the destruction of the glory of Christ. And then <clears throat> let's continue reading in that letter that he responded to, to his, his opponent. Rome has destroyed the glory of Christ in many ways by calling upon saints to intercede when Jesus Christ is the one mediated between God and man. By adoring the Blessed Virgin when Christ alone shall be adored. By offering um, the, the communal sacrifice in mass when the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross is complete and sufficient, by elevating tradition to the level of scripture, and even by making the word of Christ dependent for its authority on the word of man. So again, here we see that John Calvin's concern was, Catholic Church, you're dishonoring Jesus, and you're elevating human thinking, and you're elevating human ability and human salvation. And that's, that was his challenge. You see, for Luther, 
the underlying revelation behind his understanding of justification by faith was scripture. It was you, scripture taught justification, by, but for Calvin, the underlying revelation behind his conviction about justification by grace and faith was the glory of God. That for, for him, the glory of God was at stake. Yeah, he believed in scripture like Luther, but for him, it was the glory of God that was at stake. Calvin strongly favored a Presbyterian form of government, which means there was a plurality of elders who would lead in each church. He also strongly emphasized the sovereignty of God, that God is sovereign. And this is a central idea in Calvin's theology. He taught that God takes the initiative in our salvation. God saves us. We don't save ourselves. He taught and strongly taught and believed in predestination and the election of saints, that we were chosen by God. And these are prominent themes in his teaching. Many people in, on the back of Calvin's life have summed up his teaching with the word tulip. And tulip uh, goes as follows. These are, this is often called the five points of Calvinism. T-U-L-I-P. Number one, T stands for total depravity of man. That we're, to we're sinners. U stands for unconditional election. That we're, we're fallen people, we can't make our way to Christ. He saved us despite us. L stands for limited atonement. That when Jesus died on the cross, his blood was shed for the elect. I stands for irresistible grace. That his grace comes to us and eventually it wins us over. And P stands for perseverance of the saints that a truly saved person, once saved, truly saved, always saved, that a truly saved person, that true faith will stand firm till the end. Okay, I mean, what I'd be interested to know is your thoughts on that. Tulip, T-U-L-I-P. Do you agree with all these five points? Just for the record, I don't. <laughs> for example, I, I think I have a difficulty with I, sorry, for, with L, limited atonement but i'd love to hear your thoughts and your reflections so what about elsewhere well elsewhere we see the reformation spreading around europe in france many protestants suffered at the hands of the catholic king francois the and in 1545 4,000 Waldesians were massacred in Provence. A group of Protestant influenced, Protestants influenced by Calvin were called the Huguenots. And <clears throat> tragically, on St. Bartholomew's Day, on the 24th of August, 1572, Charles IX of France ordered the assassination of the Huguenot leaders in Paris. 2,000 Protestants were murdered in Paris and 20,000 Protestants were killed across the rest of France. In the months that followed, as many as 70,000 were killed in France and French Protestants gained a national religious freedom in 1598 through the Edict of Nantes. Many Huguenots fled, many to the UK, many to the Netherlands, uh, many today living in the UK with French sounding names originally came here with the Huguenots. And interesting, this, this painting here was painted by Francois Dubois, a French Huguenot painter. And actually, it's the only surviving work and is best known, it's the best known description of what took place on St. Bartholomew's Day in the massacre. You see, we, we don't obviously have photographs going back to those days. We don't have journalists, we don't have Twitter, we don't have any other way of recording it. But this French Huguenot painter who survived the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day recorded the scenes uh, across Paris in this painting. And then in the Netherlands, <coughs> King Philip II of Netherlands ruled Netherlands and he introduced the Inquisition there. That, uh, that's the, the Catholic Church's heavy handed way of dealing with heretics. He introduced the Inquisition there and it became evident uh, that it was even an offence to read the Bible. Beheadings and burnings were everyday events and over 100,000 people perished. William of Orange began to fight for religious and civil freedom. He was assassinated in 1584 
uh, and William laid the foundations for the Dutch national uh, and uh, for the Dutch nation and for the strong Protestant tradition in that nation. Uh, in Spain, Lutheranism was well received, belief in the Reformation, belief in the gospel was well received in Spain, but the movement was virtually wiped out completely by the Spanish Inquisition uh, in 1559 and 1560. And in Hungary, Calvinism had spread widely in Hungary and grew in spite of intense persecution. By the 19th century, Hungary had the second largest Presbyterian church in the world. In Italy, um, the, the Inquisition was less cruel, but torture, imprisonment and death were commonplace for Protestants in Italy. Then it brings us to the UK. And this is, I guess you could call this the English Reformation. And uh, this, this, this happened when an event took place with King Henry VIII. Henry VIII was originally a devout Roman Catholic. The Pope gave him the defender, the, the title, Defender of the Faith, because of his book on the seven sacraments, in which he attacked Luther's doctrines. And to this day, as you know, in, in the UK, the Queen, the Queen, <laughs> the King, the Queen, the Queen, the Queen has this title, Defender of the Faith, which was the original title given to Henry VIII. Um, but when he decided to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon, the Pope refused him permission. And in 1531, Henry took the situation in hand by taking control of the church in England. And he forbid clergy. Oops, my screen's disappeared. Give me a second. Here we go. Back up and running again. <coughs> he 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 forbid. So 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 he took the. He, he, the Pope refused for him to divorce his wife and he said, well, I'm no longer going to be under the Catholic Church. And he took control of the church in England and he forbid clergy from receiving any orders from Rome. And he appointed Thomas Cramer as the Archbishop of Canterbury. The Church of England came into being and it made King Henry the supreme head of the Church of England and he got to divorce his wife. As the influence of the Reformation touched England, changes also came. Unnecessarily holy days and the abuse of images and relics were discouraged. And saying prayers over beads and to saints, these sorts of things were removed and discouraged. He seized uh, the wealthy monasteries of England and sold them on. Partly he did this for two reasons. He, he feared that the monasteries would harbour Roman Catholic sympathisers. Also, having cut ties with Rome, Henry needed money, so he sold the monasteries to make money. Which is why England has so many ruined abbeys and monasteries dotted around the countryside. Interesting, King Henry VIII basically wanted the church in England to continue to practice just like the Catholic Church, minus the Pope. But the influence, because of the influence of reformers like Tyndale and others, this changed this. So the reformers were starting to bring change to the Church in England, and the Church of England was starting to look different to the Catholic Church, more and more so. Henry started getting cold feet and feared the speed of change. And sadly, later on in his reign, he started executing and persecuting both the Catholics and the reformers towards the end of his reign. Now that leads me to William Tyndale. William Tyndale, and you may have heard of like Tyndale Press, often on the, on the back of your Bible, you have the Tyndale Press or some Christian books you might read. Tyndale was educated in Oxford and in Cambridge universities, uh, where he became a strong supporter of the Reformation. He could speak seven languages and was proficient in Hebrew and in Greek. Tyndale discovered the gospel as he was reading Erasmus's Greek version of the New Testament. And again, here we see, just like Luther, 
just like Calvin, just like Zwingli. Here we see William Tyndale reading the Bible. And it was through reading the Bible and seeing for himself the truths of God that when William Tyndale, a fire was lit in his heart. Folks, I want to encourage you, find your basis of truth in the Bible. Not, not even, don't, don't make preachers your main basis of truth. It's good to listen to preachers. But listen primarily to God's words. Because preachers only have authority to the degree they stick with the Bible. Let the word of God be the fuel in your fire. That will keep you strong for the long term. Say amen if you agree. And so here we see William Tyndale getting saved as he's reading the New Testament. Um, and Erasmus, who was 28 years older than Tyndale, who gave, who, whose translation of the Bible, William Tyndale became a Christian reading, he gave him this vision and this mission. This is a, this is a quote from Erasmus. Christ desires his mysteries to be published abroad as widely as possible. I would that the Gospels and the epistles of Paul were translated into all languages for all Christian people, that they might be read and known. And that quote from Erasmus became the vision of Tyndale's life. In 1523, Tyndale moved to London and asked permission from the Bishop of London to be able to translate the New Testament into common English. Now, apparently, translating the New Testament into English was illegal without the permission of the king. So the bishop was asked, the Bishop of London was asked, but then the bishop denied Tyndale's request. Now Tyndale was very concerned for his own safety. In 1524, concerned for his safety, Tyndale left England for Germany, and he based himself in Worms, where he, there he finished the English translation of the Greek New Testament. And he began to smuggle the Bibles back into England and into the UK in bales of cloth. You imagine that? It's like these days we're worried about drugs being smuggled into the country. Back in those days, they were smuggling Bibles back into the country. In 1526, the book was banned by the Bishop of London. But by now, there was about 3,000 copies of the Bible in circulation. Henry VIII was furious. The English authorities bought up the copies of the translation, which ironically helped finance Tyndale's work. And then they hatched a plan to silence William Tyndale. William Tyndale said this, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life, ere many years, I will cause a boy who drives the plough to know more of the scriptures than you do. In other words, I want the common peasant who looks after a farm to know the Bible better than the Pope knows the Bible. And to be honest, in those days, the Pope's faith were often so shallow that that wouldn't have been hard. William Tyndale moved to Antwerp, a city which was relatively free from both English and Catholic spies. So he wanted to be protected from Henry VIII and, and the English spies who people were looking out for him, trying to capture William Tyndale. But also the Roman Catholics were looking out for him as well. For nine years, he managed, with the help of friends, to evade the authorities. He revised his New Testament translation and he began started translating the Old Testament. Eventually, Tyndale was betrayed and arrested in the Netherlands in 1536. He was condemned as a heretic and delivered to the secular authorities for punishment. And on Friday, the 6th of October, Tyndale was brought to the cross in the middle of the market square and given a chance publicly to recant his beliefs. He refused. And he was given a moment to pray. And John Fox, in his book, the Fox's Book of Martyrs, records his final words. His prayer was, Lord open the King of England's eyes. He was bound to the beam and both an iron chain and a rope was put around his neck. The executioner standing behind Tyndale quickly tightened the noose, strangling him. And then an official uh, took up a lighted torch and handed it to the executioner who set the wood ablaze. Within four years, Four English translations of the Bible were published in England at the king's command, including Henry's official Great Bible, which was all based on Tyndale's work. God answered Tyndale's prayer. 
Henry put a Bible in every church in England. And the impact of the translation, well, uh, it's, it's, here's a great quote from an historian. It is no exaggeration to say that it set fire to Europe, said one historian, that literally these new truths, which are ancient truth, the gospel, as people, common people, the peasant, the farmer, the ordinary people were able for the first time to read the gospel, read scripture, read Paul's writings, understand Romans, really get to grips. We're saved by grace. It set fire to Europe in a good way. And the Reformation just spread and spread and spread. Absolutely incredible. Then there's Mary Tudor. This is 1553. She was born to 1558. She died. Also known as Bloody Mary. Mary was, Queen Mary was a fervent Catholic and was determined to bring England back to Rome. She put out, she put 1,200 married clergy out of jobs because she said, you can't be married if you're a Catholic priest. So she wanted Catholicism to come back to England. And once again, she gave the Pope recognition as head of the church in England. She put to death about 300 true Christian leaders, hence her name, Bloody Mary. She imprisoned the Archbishop Thomas Kramer, who had previously been appointed by Henry VIII. And under great pressure, he signed a paper in which he recanted the changes that he had made and his beliefs. But later, he reinstated his biblical convictions and was burnt at the stake in 1556. So having under pressure said, okay, I agree with you, Bloody Mary, I'm going to recant my beliefs in the Reformation. He felt so conscience stricken that he changed and said, actually, no, I hold to the truth of the Bible. And as a result, he was burned at the stake. And actually, when he was bound to the stake, he, he declared, as he was being bound to the stake, that he declared that he deeply regretted recanting his Protestant stand. And as, he, as the fire was being lit underneath him, he took a hand that had signed the paper recanting his beliefs, and he plunged that hand into the flames first and watched it until it was burned to a cinder as a way of saying, I regret signing my, that paper recanting my beliefs. In Oxford on Broad Street, if you go there, you can see the site where two particular leaders um, were, were burned at the stake, Latimer and Ridley. And it's, it's there at, on Broad Street, there's a cross on the street. Uh, and you, you, you can see that just in, in the cobbles there. And as they were bound together, Latimer turned to Ridley and said, be of good cheer, Master Ridley, play the man. For we shall this day light such a candle in England, as I trust by God's grace, that will never be put out. That was the courage of these reformers who stood for truth, despite intense persecution and pressure. Now let's move north to Scotland. And now we come to a precious young man by the name of Patrick Hamilton, born in 1504 AD. He was born into a rich family and he was related to the king. At age 14, he went to university in Paris. Age 14. That's crazy. I mean, age 14 year olds these days are kind of, I don't know, <laughs> they're certainly not going to university in Paris. And it was there that he heard Luther's teachings and about the Reformation. After finishing university, Hamilton returned home in 1524 and became a professor at the University of St Andrews. In 1525, Parliament passed a law prohibiting bringing Luther's books into Scotland. But by this point, many copies were still available, along with the first translations of the Bible from Greek into English by William Tyndale. And here, Patrick Hamilton in St. Andrews was reading Luther and reading the scriptures. And Patrick Hamilton came to faith in Jesus. He straight away started preaching the gospel. Now, St. Andrews at the time in Scotland was the center of Roman Catholicism. And at this point, his new belief started attracting the attention of the Archbishop James Beaton in 1527. Uh, age 27, sorry, age 23, Hamilton, fearing for his life, then fled to Germany. In Germany, Hamilton met with Luther and was so impacted by meeting his hero, the reformer, the great Martin Luther. Martin Luther wrote, sorry, Patrick 
Hamilton wrote a book called Patrick's Places, in which he describes very, very clearly the true gospel. And you can still get copies today. He was determined to return to Scotland to preach, even though he knew in doing so it would be at the risk of his life. He returned and he began preaching the gospel with great boldness. His, op his opponents initially allowed him to preach openly in the University of St Andrews for about a month, hoping that it would give them more evidence against him. However, instead, many people were coming to faith, including many, many important people, uh, leaders in society were coming to faith in Jesus. In 1528, Archbishop of St Andrews summons Patrick Hamilton for a debate, but it was a trap. Hamilton arrived for the debate and was arrested. A church court was hurriedly rushed through and within a record time, they convicted him of heresy. While most heresy trials take often weeks, Hamilton's trial was rushed through in 12 hours. He was sentenced to death and it took lot, six long, painful hours for Hamilton to die as he was being burned at the stake and the, the wind kept blowing out the fire. Patrick was the first Scottish Protestant martyr, just 24 years old. Hamilton's last words were this. How long, O Lord, shall darkness cover this realm? How long will you suffer the tyranny of men? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. If you go to, is it North Street in St Andrews? Um, it's the one north of, of Market Street. There's three main streets in St Andrews, it's not hard to get lost. And on the North Street, right beside the quadrangle, the university quadrangle, on the ground there, there's a PH on the grounds. And that's the spot where Patrick Hamilton was executed. And his death actually inspired widespread interest in the Reformation and it intensified the opposition to Catholicism. And then that brings us to this great man by the name of George Wisher. George Wishart was a tall, handsome, well-mannered man, and he became the spokesman for Scotland's growing Protestant movement, travelled throughout Scotland proclaiming the gospel, Reformation truths, and with great skill and passion and conviction. Those who came to worship services conducted by George Wishart found, instead of the normal mass in Latin and congregational singing, they found a, 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 they found a, a passionate worship time and a fiery hour-long message in their own language. John Knox described Wisher. He said this, he was clearly illuminated with the spirit of prophecy that he saw not only things pertaining to himself, but such things as some towns and the whole realm afterwards felt, which he forespake, not in secret, but in the audience of many. What John Knox was saying is that George Wishart moved in the gift of prophecy. He not only saw things that were going to happen in his own life, but he saw in the Holy Spirit things that were going to happen for entire towns and cities. Wishart uh, publicly was preaching on the Book of Romans in Dundee, and huge crowds of people were gathering to hear him. Now, Beaton, Cardinal David Beaton, was the, the, the Catholic cardinal who executed Patrick Hamilton in St Andrews. And when Cardinal David Beaton heard that George Wishart was attracting such great crowds in Dundee as he was listening to the Roman, Romans being preached, uh, he used his influence to have the local magistrates of Dundee forbid Wishart from preaching to the city again. The magistrate, Robert Milne, delivered the charge in public at the conclusion of one of Wishart's lectures. He stood up and he, and he declared, you cannot preach here now, we forbid you. And the preacher looked towards heaven and remained silent for a while. No one moved. And then at last, he looked down and he looked at the magistrate and he said this, God is my witness. I never desired your trouble, but your comfort. But I am sure to reject the word of God and to drive away his messengers is not the way to save you from trouble, but to bring you into it. When I am gone, if it be well with you for a long while, I am not led by the spirit of truth. But if unexpected trouble comes upon you, remember this is the cause and turn to God by repentance 
for he is merciful. So he said, basically, he was prophesying that now that you've kicked me out of your city, that's going to bring harm on you. And he said, and if, if everything goes well with you, then I haven't spoken by the spirit of God. But if when I leave, things go bad for you, then turn to God in repentance, because this is God's judgment on you. Wishart left town. And four days after Wishart left Dundee, a severe pr plague broke out in Dundee. A month later, <clears throat> the news of the plague reached Wishart, who was then by that point in Western Scotland preaching. He immediately returned to Dundee to comfort the sufferers. When he arrived, he stood at the East Gate and preached a sermon on, he sent Psalm 107 verse 20, he sent forth his word and healed them and he rescued them from the grave. He preached from that verse. At risk of his own life, Wisher stayed with the infected people and cared for them until the plague abated. Cardinal David Beaton, the Archbishop of St Andrews, had at this point had five Protestants executed in 1544 and had twice tried to have Wisher murdered. Wisher, both occasions, had escaped assassination attempt because God gave him supernatural revelation of what was about to happen. After a failed attempt in his life, believers would or organize for Wisher to literally move location every day to avoid capture. John Knox, well, you'll learn about him as we go forward. John Knox was one of George Wishart's traveling companions. He was armed, he was actually his bodyguard. John Knox carried a large double-handed sword, a broad sword, and was part of the bodyguard who was appointed to travel with Wishart. In 1546, Wishart, sensing that his arrest was imminent, dismissed the bodyguard saying, one is sufficient for a sacrifice. Again, he understood in the Holy Spirit that he was about to be arrested. His intuition was right. Within five hours, he was captured by 500 of Beaton's men and wish it was condemned as a heretic and strangled and burned by the order of Cardinal Beating. The execution took place just opposite uh, the tower of St. Andrew's Castle, uh, which today is a ruin. Um, rich cushions were placed in the windows of the castle so that the Cardinal and his guests, Cardinal Beaton, might watch in comfort. The executioner tried to tied him to the stake. Wisher prayed for his accusers, asking that God would forgive his accusers. The executioner was so moved by this that he asked Wisher forgiveness, to which he replied, come hither. The, execution, the executioner drew, drew near to Wisher and Wisher kissed him on his cheek and he said, I forgive you, do your work. The fire was lit. And the gunpowder blew up. Wishart declared, the flame has scorched my body and yet has not daunted my spirit. He was still alive. And then, and this is a street scene from, just, just to be clear, they didn't have cars in those days. <laughs> this is a Google Max street scene. And this is the, these are the windows of the St. Andrew's Castle where Beaton and his companions were watching the execution. And this spot here, it says GW on the pavement. That's the spot where George Wishart was being executed. <clears throat> he looked up, George Wishart looked up to Cardinal Beaton, who was up at the window, and he said this, He who from yonder place looks upon me with such pride shall in a few days lie in the same. And George Wishart died. On May the 28th, 1548, less than three months later, after Beaton had murdered George Wisher. Beaton was murdered in the same castle from which he heard Wisher's prophecy against him. And within two months of the execution of Wisher, 16 Scottish nobles who had become Christians stormed St Andrew's Castle, assassinated Beaton in the most brutal way. Uh, before being struck down, Beaton was told, repent thee of thy former wicked life especially of the shedding of the blood of the notable instrument of God, Master George Wisher, which cries for vengeance, which, which blood cries for vengeance. We from God are sent to avenge it. Thou hast been and remained an obstinate enemy against Jesus Christ and his holy evangel, the gospel. And that then brings me to John Knox and the Scottish Reformation. 
John Knox was born 1505. And as you've heard, John Knox was part of George Wishart's traveling team. He was actually George Wishart's bodyguard. Scotland was a separate country from England at the time, and it was well prepared for the Reformation. It was well prepared for, th for three ways. It had the godly heritage of the Celtic church, you remember from Patrick and Columba. The gospel had widely impacted Scotland in the previous generations. Number two, there was a steady spread of Luther's ideas throughout Scotland. And number three, there was the well-known decadence of the Catholic leaders and people knew full well about the corrupt lifestyles and their decadence while a lot of people lived in poverty. Knox, John Knox was born in Haddington, not far from Edinburgh here. And in 1529, he studied theology in St. Andrews. And in 1536, he was ordained. In the early 1540s, John Knox came under the influence of the reformers and he became a, a, he became a Christian follower of Jesus. He was saved through the preaching of Tola, uh, Thomas Galeem, who was a converted friar in 1543. Following this, he became the bodyguard for George Wishart and traveled with George Wishart and learned and was mentored by George, George Wishart. Here's an example of John Knox's passion for truth and against heresy. He was visiting a, a church service in St Andrews and he says in the church service the, the priest had declared that the Catholic Church was the bride of Christ. At this point John Knox stood up and interrupted the priest declaring that the Roman Catholic Church was no bride of Christ but a prostitute and that the Roman papacy had degenerated further from the faith than the apostles, uh, the faith of the apostles than the Jews had from Moses when they crucified Christ. The congregation demand that John Knox justify his remarks in a sermon the following Sunday. And the following Sunday, John Knox preached at the Roman Catholic Church. And he preached that the Roman Catholic Church was the synagogue of Satan. One observer noted that while others snip it at the outer branches of papacy, John Knox struck at the root to destroy the whole. <laughs> he was fearless absolutely fearless. Following uh, Beaton's assassination, Cardinal Beaton's assassination in St Andrew's Castle, John Knox went and joined the besieged Protestant, Protestant who were in St Andrew's Castle. They'd laid siege to it and taken over it. Uh, and he became their chaplain. By the way, he didn't approve of their assassination of Cardinal Beaton, but he did want to support them in their conviction and in their faith. At the time, Scotland was virtually ruled by the French and they wished to use it as a base to crush the Protestants in the England. A French fleet laid siege to St Andrew's Castle, which surrendered in July 1547. John Knox at the time was aged 33 and most of the Protestants were condemned with him to serve as a life, condemned for life to serve as galley slaves. Now, a life sentence in the galleys was considered the most severe punishment after execution. Um, John Knox described his time in the galleys as torment and affliction. During this time in the galleys, he contracted kidney infections, stomach ulcers, which affected him for the rest of his life. What it would be like is 150 galley slaves would, would be in a ship. Six slaves per oar. 25 oars, each one 14 metres in length, and the rowers were kept chained to the oars even when they were not doing their duties. Slave masters in the ships carried whips to ensure that the convicts kept rowing. They were placed under pressure to renounce their Protestantism and embrace Catholicism while they were galley slaves. One time during a Catholic mass, as it was being celebrated, <coughs> the song um, o Holy Queen was being sung and a statue of the Virgin Mary was being passed around the prisoners for them to kiss. John Knox refused and he said, trouble me not with such an, uh, such an idol is accursed. And then the statue was, was thrust again in John Knox's face for him to kiss. And he grasped it and threw it overboard and he said, now let Our Lady save herself. She is light enough, let her swim. Just to be clear, I don't think John Knox had a problem with Mary per se, but he had a problem with what the Catholic Church had done with Mary and made her into an idol of worship. Um, the English Protestant 
uh, the English government was Protestant at the time, and King Edward VI took a direct interest in the plight of these prisoners, the galley slaves. And in February 1549, 18 months after John Knox and others had been made galley slaves, John Knox was released as part of a prisoner exchange. On his release, John Knox spends the next five years in England as an honoured guest. And at the time, England was Protestant. When King Edward VI died, the future of Protestants in England looked bleak. Uh, Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary, made clear her intention to reinstate Catholicism as the national religion. John Knox described her as the wicked English Jezebel. And Knox, along with thousands of other English Protestants, sought refuge in Protestant Germany and Switzerland. In 1554, John Knox travelled to Geneva and there he met Calvin. And Knox described Calvin's Geneva as the most perfect school of Christ that ever was on earth since the days of the apostles. While Knox was in exile in Europe, Protestant congregations were forming back in Edinburgh, Dundee, St Andrews, Perth and Brecon. Most of these were secret meetings. In 1555, John Knox returned to Scotland and spent nine months preaching extensively through the land. The Catholic bishops summoned him to Edinburgh in May 1556 to face legal charges. John Knox returned at that point to Geneva. Knox asked Calvin whether it was permissible to resist by force any monarch that was idolatrous. Calvin believed that individuals could take their stand against laws contrary to the, God's word, but he didn't believe that a revolt was right. Knox, however, was coming to believe that Christians have an obligation to revolution against a tyrannical monarchy. John Knox said this, if princes exceed their bounds, there is no doubt that they may be resisted with power. In May 1559, John Knox returned from exile and he returned to Scotland and his prayer was this, give me Scotland or I die. He arrived in Perth. He preached a passionate message against the Catholic Church, against idolatry, and it caused a riot. After the service, the congregation immediately began to demolish the altars and the statues and the crucifixes. And Scottish Protestant nobles and their armies, called the Lords of the Congregation, led by James Stewart, they occupied Perth, Stirling, St Andrews, and by the end of June, Edinburgh. On the 17th of August, Parliament abolished mass and rejected papal jurisdiction over Scotland. It cancelled all the laws which contradicted reform faith and John Knox was elected as minister at St Giles in Edinburgh's High Street. His reformation preaching reverberated throughout Scotland. In his preaching, John Knox typically spent half an hour calmly unpacking a biblical passage and then he applied the text to the Scottish situation. And as he did, he became active and vigorous and would violently pound the pulpit. One note taker said, he made me so quick and tremble that I could not hold my pen to write. John Knox said this, I have never, I have never feared the devil, but I tremble every time I enter the pulpit. In other words, he saw his preaching as a gift, as a responsibility, as a stewardship, and he took it very, very seriously. Revival broke out in Scotland, 1559. The conversions were so rapid that John Knox wrote, God did so multiply our number that it appeared as if men had rained from the clouds. One Scottish church historian writes, in Scotland, the whole nation was converted by lump. Within 10 years, there was not 10 persons of quality to be found in it who did not pr profess the true reformed faith, the true reformed religion. And so it was among in common portion. Lo, here a nation was born in a day. John Knox laid out plans for a comprehensive application of the gospel to every aspect of Scottish society. He wanted a kirk in every school, sorry, a kirk and a school in every parish. So a church building and a school in every parish, a college in every town and a university in every city. 
and regular organization provision of uh, organized provision of uh, food for the poor. In 1561, Mary Queen of Scots, the Catholic Queen, returns. She refused to align herself with the Scottish Reformed faith, and she insisted that Scottish remain officially Catholic. She had strong alliances with Philip II of Spain, and the leaders of France were strongly Catholic, and which posed a threat to the emerging Reformation movement in Scotland. She frequently clashed with John Knox, who was so frank yet courteous towards the Queen. Uh, she said, famously, I am more afraid of the prayers of John Knox than the armies of 10,000. In 1570, John Knox suffered a stroke, but continued to preach for the last few months of his life. Even as his health was deteriorating, he insisted in being carried to the pulpit. Again, feeling that sense of responsibility before God. Before he died in 1572, John Knox had the joy of seeing papal authority in Scotland outlawed. All future rulers of Scotland were to swear to uphold reformed truth. And, and I quote, the day before John Knox died, he said, I have been fighting against Satan, who has been ever ready for the assault. I have fought against spiritual wickedness and have prevailed. John Knox's last words were this, live in Christ, live in Christ, and the flesh need not fear death. Live in Christ, live in Christ, and the flesh need not fear death. Otto Scott, describing what had happened, said this. The great Christian revolution. He summarized the achievement of John Knox and he says, Knox had humbled a reigning monarch, toppled a government, ousted a hierarchy, converted the people and could regard towards those uh, close to his life. The landscape transformed by his efforts and the teachings of his mentor, Calvin. Knox's triumph in Scotland severed the tentacle of France and lessened the threat of the Reformation to the Reformation in England. And on his grave, it says, here lies a man who neither flattered nor feared any flesh. His legacy was he birthed the Presbyterian Church in Scotland, the Church of Scotland was birthed by John Knox's Reformation. The Reformation changed the whole lifestyle of Scottish people. John Knox rightly insisted on character change as a proof of justification and high moral standards prevailed in the nation. His schools led to the Scottish education system becoming the best in the world. And as the BBC um, in an article called Made in Scotland says, from golf to television to the telephone, Scotland prides itself on being a country that has led the way in many of the world's great inventions. But where does this power of invention spring from? In the Reformation, the Scottish Kirk demanded a school in every parish. And 200 years on, that learning led the way to the ingenuity and creativity of the Scottish Enlightenment. In other words, it wasn't just a spiritual transformation that happened in Scotland. It resulted in a social transformation. Education was changed. The way the poor were treated was changed. And it led the way to the Scottish education system being a world leader with universities and colleges and, 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 and then from this inventions coming in and inventions that have changed the world. And I give thanks to God that true transformation leads to transform society. So folks, right on our doorsteps here in Scotland, God has done a great thing. And it's through understanding reformed truth. And that comes from the Bible, not man's ideas, but God's ideas. God's ideas change society. Folks, we've covered a lot of ground. I hope it's been helpful. And let's pray that God will use this in our lives to bring transformation. Thanks so much for joining me today.